life is full of disappointments and wounds and hurts. And we know there is an enemy who steals and kills and destroys. But Jesus has given us life and hope and peace. And we know that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We don't fight against flesh and blood, but principalities, powers, and darkness. We've been called to be overcomers, and we can, and we will. In the heart of every Christ follower, every one of us in this room that know Christ, every Christ follower, there is a spiritual battle that is raging. But in many Christians' lives, they have forgotten who the real enemy is. Every single church is engaged in a battlefield of life and death, but many churches have forgotten who the real enemy is. Many churches are at war with each other, Christians fighting each other, oftentimes over stuff that doesn't actually matter, over the color of the carpet, for crying out loud, all over policies that mean very little or nothing. And all the while they're forgetting that there is an unseen enemy who is pulling on their pride to fight and war and to tear down even the work of God in their church, and all the while, that enemy is totally ignored. We're in a series entitled, The Invisible War. It is a series about spiritual warfare. You and I are engaged in a battle, and this morning, we are looking in this series at who that battle is against, the invisible war, a spiritual battle, the same one that the Apostle Paul was talking about in Ephesians chapter 6 and verses 11, 10 and 11 when he says, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. Look at that phrase, put on the full armor of God. This is military talk. This is battle talk. He says, put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the devil's schemes. Last week, we began in this series, The Invisible War, by talking about where Satan came from and why Satan fell. And this morning, I want us to talk about what are the goals, the objectives, the strategies of Satan in our lives. One of the great intellectual minds of Christian minds of the 20th century was a man named C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis was the intellectual's intellectual. I would have loved to have been around him, but I would have felt like a tiny little speck. This guy was such a brilliant guy. C.S. Lewis, though, was an atheist through most of his life, and then in his adult life, here he was, a professor at uh, uh, Oxford University, he came to know Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. He became one of the great Christian apologists in, in the world. He's, um, he was an amazing man. C.S. Lewis made this statement. He said, there are two equal and opposite dangers. One is to deny the existence of the devil, and the other is to become preoccupied with him. In this series, I'm wanting to thread that needle. I want us to understand who our enemy is. I want us to understand what he's trying to do in our lives, how he comes against us individually and as a church. I want us to talk about how we can live an overcoming life and live in victory every day of our life. But I don't want us to see a demon behind every bush. I want there to be a sense of balance by how we address this topic, and that's what C.S. Lewis was talking about. And that will be the goal in the series. Next Sunday in this series, we're going to be talking about angels, the good guys. 
angels that the Bible talks about that are involved in our lives as well, the good guys. We're going to be talking about them. And then the next week after that is demons, the bad guys. And then beyond that, we're going to be talking about how to live every day victorious in our Christian life. This is the series we're going through. But today, I want to talk to you about living in enemy territory. And I want to begin sort of where we left off last Sunday about who is Satan. We learned last Sunday that Satan is a created being, that, that he was actually an angel of light, that God created Satan to be one of the most powerful of all angels, the most beautiful of all angels. But in the midst of his power and his beauty, the Old Testament in Ezekiel and Isaiah told us that he became proud and arrogant in his beauty and his power, and he decided that he would try to usurp God's throne and God's power. And because of that, God cast him down. Satan now is trying to reproduce himself in our lives, in the lives of everyone that he can. He is in the midst of doing that. The Scripture talks about Satan as being a real being, a real being. I realize that there are some who think he's just a personification of evil, but nowhere in the Bible does it say that about him. In fact, Jesus believed in a real being called Satan. In Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1, it gives us this word. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. And if you read the rest of that passage for the next 10 or 15 verses, you will read a conversation that actually happens between Jesus and Satan in which Jesus speaks to him, in which Satan speaks back, and which Satan is trying to tempt Jesus to thwart the plan of God. All through the, the ministry of Jesus, if you read through the Gospels, you're going to read all through the four Gospels, there are times in which Jesus talks about and to Satan. There are times in which Jesus talks about and to demons, and they speak back to him. They, were, they are very real beings, and Satan is a very real being, and Jesus knew that. In fact, the Bible talks about Satan in 174 different places, and in each one of those places, it is always he is a real individual, a real being. Never in the Bible anywhere does the Bible treat Satan as just a personification of evil. So I want us to grab that idea as we are beginning this series. He is a real being. Now, as a real being, as this angel of light that has fallen... What is he trying now to accomplish? What are his goals and objectives that he is trying to accomplish in us and others? Well, there are two central goals of Satan in the world. The first one is pretty obvious. He wants to keep as many people from having a relationship with God as possible. Listen to me. He does not want you to know God. He does not want you to know the God who made you. He does not want you to have a relationship with Him. He does not want your life to be changed by Jesus Christ. And He will use every excuse that He can manufacture in your life to keep you away from God. He will use every excuse for Christians to not share Christ with other people in our family, in our extended family, in, in our friends and our classmates and our, our co-workers to get us to not share Christ with them. There are times in which you and I, we sense in our heart, God is saying, I want you to share Jesus with this person at work or with this person in your family. And immediately there is another voice that says, well, I don't dare do that. There is no way I could probably do it. I won't say the right words. I'd mess it all up. It is God who's telling you the first thing. You know who's telling you the second. Here is the truth. Every one of us who know Christ as Savior have a testimony of what God has done in our lives. We can share what God has done in our lives. This church has gone beyond that. We have trained right now over 1,400 people to be able to share your faith using a gospel conversation workshop that we used to do that, to give you the training. Another one's coming up next Sunday. Get trained. Learn how to share your faith. But can I tell you that out there in the, in the information center, there are these 
little pamphlets that simply you walk through with someone who doesn't know Christ. Just read it with them. It shares the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here's the truth. You can't mess it up. And Satan knows that. You can't mess it up. God is leading you to share Christ with others. The greatest goal of Satan is to keep a person who does not know Christ from ever coming and seeing their lives be changed forever. Listen to what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. The God of this age, and notice he's talking about Satan here. Now pause for just a moment. Notice that the word God has a little g in it. He's not talking about the God of the universe. He is talking about the God of this world's system. In fact, in 1 John chapter 5, he uses that very phrase. He, Satan is the God, little g, of this world's system, of this culture. There is a biblical worldview, meaning a worldview is how you view the world. There is a biblical worldview, and God says, here is the truth. I created the world. I created the universe. I created you. And sin came and affect and changed us and broke the relationship that we would have with God. But Christ came and died on the cross and paid the penalty for our sin and rose again from the grave. And God offers to us the gift of eternal life. And when we receive Jesus as our Savior and commit our heart to Him, He changes us. He forgives us. He begins to make us a brand new person. And the Bible says, here is how God wants you to live. And here is what God says is right, and here is what God says is wrong. Have you noticed in the culture, it is almost a total different opinion about almost everything. Why? Because God is the author of this worldview from Scripture. But Satan is the author of this culture. And that which is right, God says is right, the culture says wrong. That which is wrong in God's eyes, the culture says is right. And there's, there's no question, there's two cultures, alternative cultures going on. And Satan is the God of the culture. And this is what he's saying in the verse, so listen to what he says. The God of this age, the God of this culture, of this world, this world view, world system, has blinded Catch this, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. How many times have we asked, God, I don't get it. How come my family cannot see what is so obvious about you? This universe didn't pop into existence. There has to be a God that brought all of this into existence. Every scientific law says that, that matter cannot come from non-matter. It is obvious that this didn't just happen, that all of this that we see in front of us didn't just happen. There is a God who is involved with all of this. God, how come I can see it so clearly about your existence, but my family member, oh God, my friend, my classmate, my work associate, why do they not see what is so obvious? God, look at the change you're making in my life. Look at the difference you've made in my life. Look at the purpose that you've given me for my life and how it has changed everything for me. God, why can't my family members see this? Why can't my person, the person I love, see what you are doing? It makes no sense until you read this verse that the God of this age has blinded the eyes of unbelievers so that they cannot see the gospel of Jesus Christ. Over and over in the Scripture, he said this, here's what we do. Here is what we, as followers of Christ, are to do. We are to pray. Make a list of people in our lives that we know do not know Jesus as Savior. Make a list and begin to pray, oh, God, open their blind eyes. God, begin to show them what is the truth. Open their blind eyes. And oftentimes, God brings some kind of a situation, some kind of an issue into their life and uses that to open their eyes to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Begin to pray. Look, every day, begin to pray. Begin to pray. Begin to pray for those in your life that need Jesus. Oh, God, open their blind eyes. The first purpose of Satan is to keep as many people away from a relationship with God as possible. 
But the second goal of Satan is to destroy those who accept Christ as Savior. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. Devour. The word devour means to eat something. So think with me for a moment. Let's say you had a hamburger in your hand right now. Some of you are thinking, yeah, that's exactly what I want right now. But just imagine the hamburger. Don't leave and go get one. Just sit right there. Just go with me. You've got a hamburger in your, in your hand, and you begin to eat the hamburger. What do you do? Your teeth begin to grind up the meat, make it into little pieces, and then you swallow it. It goes down into your stomach. And the gastric juices begin to work on it, and the enzymes in your stomach begin to work on it, and it begins to tear apart those little pieces of, of hamburger, and then it goes into your digestive system, and before you know it, it's all gone. It's all gone. It is totally destroyed, and it has become a part now of you. And aren't you glad you came to church today to understand this whole digestive system? Now you get it. Satan is not wanting to eat you, but he is wanting to destroy you. And that's what he's saying. Jesus said in John 10.10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you may have life. God is saying, I want to make your life the best life possible. I want to infuse your life with my power. But let me tell you, the enemy wants to steal that from you. He wants to kill you. He wants to destroy your life. What he is saying to us is is that that Satan doesn't just want to annoy you or bother you. You better take him seriously. He wants to destroy you. So how is it? That since this is his goal, how is it that he works in our life to destroy us? What are his objectives? What does he do? Well, the first thing the Bible says is that he attacks through deception. He comes and attacks our life through deception. Listen to what Jesus said in John 8, 44. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. Satan was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, and there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Satan comes and whispers into our ear. He says to you and me, I realize that this thing that I I think you ought to do, it destroyed others, but it won't destroy you. This thing that I want you to do and that you want to do, you feel it, don't you? You want to do this? Don't worry. It won't hurt you. It won't destroy you. You're too smart for that. You are so cunning. You are so wise. No, what hurt others won't hurt you. Don't worry about it. They got caught, but you'll never get caught. You're so different. You're so special. He is such a liar. He knows good and well that if you take the bait, if you go in that direction, it will destroy you. He does know that it will be found out. He does know it will be exposed, and it will damage your life. He's a liar. Listen to what the Bible says in Revelation 12, verse 9. The great dragon was hurled down, the ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. You're not an exception to that, and neither am I. He's a liar. He'll tell you, God doesn't love you anymore. You don't matter to Him. You've blown it for the last time. God doesn't want anything to do with you. You don't have any future. Nobody cares about you. You've messed up so many times. There's no recovering for you. He's a liar. God does not throw his children away. God loves you and will love you forever. God allows us to experience the discipline of our wrong decisions. He does. God allows us to go through the hurt and the pain of the wrong decisions that we have made. Yes, He does, but God does not throw us away. 
He still loves you. He cares for you. And He is saying to you, I welcome you back. Come back to me. I want you to be my child. I want to have a close relationship with you. I haven't quit on you. You're the one that quit on me. But if you'll come back, I will in no way cast you aside. He's a liar. Satan is a liar. God loves you. What are the ways in which he is lying to you? Satan is a deceiver. Second, he uses the tactic of attacking us through perversion. The word perversion means to change something from its intended purpose. God has given us so many good things in our life. Look at all the wonderful blessings that He's given to us in our life. But with every good thing God gives to us, He has a boundary around it. I don't know if you remember, but in in July, our our church went through a series on on boundaries, and we we realized that boundaries are not a negative thing. They're a good thing. Boundaries are actually a liberating thing, that God, with all the good things that He gives to us, He places a boundary around those good things and says, don't go past this boundary. He is trying to protect us, not kill our joy. The boundaries actually liberate us if we're willing to allow them to. Satan comes against those good things and he says, forget the boundaries. Just experience. Just whatever, go beyond it. Think about all of the good things God has given to us of food and of relationships and of sexual intimacy and money and things and pleasure and so many things he's given to us. And these are gifts from God. But within every one of them, there are boundaries. So what are the boundaries that Satan is tempting you to violate that good thing that God has given to you? That's what perversion is. It's taking a good thing and going beyond the boundaries that God has established. Third, Satan attacks through oppression. A Christ follower cannot be possessed by Satan because we are already possessed by the Holy Spirit of God. Just as it says in 1 John 4, verse 4, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of us. But even though Christians cannot be possessed by Satan, Christ's followers can be oppressed by the enemy. That word oppression means to put down by unjust use of power. Satan's oppression to a Christian is the repeated pressure that he brings to bear in our lives to discourage us. Anybody experience that? To discourage us, to worry us, to bring fear and depression in our life. In what ways is he oppressing you? I can never measure up. I will never be good enough. What ways does he use to oppress you? Satan's objectives are to deceive us, to lead us to live in perversion, to pervert that which is good in our lives, and to oppress our life. So what are the strategies that he uses? Those are his objectives. So what are the strategies that he uses in our life? Satan has a strategy for conquering us. There's four parts to the strategy. Oh, I want you to get this. I want you to hear what I'm about to say to you, what I'm about to teach you, because this is so critical. You and I can actually see these things unfolding in our lives. So take good notes. Really listen through. What are the strategies that Satan uses to accomplish this perversion, to accomplish the deceit in our life. What are the strategies that he uses? There are four key steps. And the first one is simply this. Satan centers his attack against our mind. It will always be an attack against our mind. He always begins with an enticing thought. Listen to what the Bible says in Proverbs 4.23. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life. What that literally means is this. Above all that is to be guarded, be sure to guard your mind because from it your whole character flows. 
The chief place of attack that Satan comes against me and you and every one of us is in the area of our thought life, in the area of our mind. It is there that God has said to us, put a guard around your mind. Be careful about what you let in. Because the more junk you let into your mind, the more junk will come out of your life. It's like a computer. You put junk in, junk will come out. And our minds are very much like that. You keep putting in the junk with movies and the junk with other junk, the other stuff in our life that is rotting. You know it is. And you think, well, it's not that big a deal. But what we put into our minds is what comes out of our lives. And what God says to us, be very careful, put a guard around your mind. James chapter 1 verse 14 says it this way, But everyone is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. That word that is translated enticed is actually a fisherman's word. It means bait, a lure. It's my understanding that there is a a turtle that lives in the ocean that feeds off fish, but the turtle is too slow to be able to catch the fish. So how is it that this turtle is able to feed off fish when he's too slow to catch them? This turtle has a tongue that is extremely long. I know that there are a lot of people that gossip, and it seems like that their tongues are very, very long. But this turtle actually has a tongue that is very, very long. And on the end of the tongue, it is red, and when he wiggles it, it looks like a worm. Go with me. This is really true. There is a turtle with a long tongue, and at the end of it, it's red, and he wiggles it, and it looks like to a fish that it is a worm. And so it catches the attention of the worm. And when the worm then tries to bite it, that turtle pulls back his tongue, but only an inch or so. And the fish is enamored now and goes again and try again, again at it and tries to bite it. And when it does, that turtle pulls back a little bit further. And further and further, you know what he's doing. The fish doesn't even see the turtle. It only sees the worm until all of a sudden the turtle has it. What is the bait that Satan is using in your life? What is the bait? He knows your hot button, doesn't he? Every one of us have hot buttons, and he knows your hot button, doesn't he? He didn't tempt you with stuff that doesn't tempt you. He knows what your weaknesses are, and He knows what mine is. And He uses those hot buttons in our life to come at us. It's bait, but it's bait with a hook in it. Every single one of the sins in our life originate with our enticing thoughts. Passing thoughts about wrong are not sin. It might not be a good passing thought, but it's a passing thought. It's not sin. But those thoughts that we grab onto and we welcome into our hearts, that's where the sin begins. Every sin emerges with harbored thoughts. Obviously, I would never do it, but I enjoy thinking about it. It's a harbored thought. It's the first step. But there's always another step. The second step is that Satan desires to diminish then our moral convictions. It goes from a harbored thought to a lustful desire. And listen to what James, how James puts it in chapter 1, verse 14. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. We haven't committed the act. It's just in our minds, it's a harbored thought that has become a lustful desire. 
I'm not going to ever do the act, obviously. I'm just going to think about it. I'm just going to enjoy desiring it, fantasizing about it, dreaming about it. Obviously, I would never do it, but I keep it around and nurture it. It's like window shopping, you know. I didn't buy anything. I just was window shopping. It is the lustful desire. So what is lust? The word lust means any good thing that oversteps the limits God approves. We just talked about that. There's boundaries around every good thing. And lust is when we come to begin to desire to go across the boundaries. We know where the boundary is. We know this good thing that God has. But there is something inside of us that is tempting us and pulling us across the boundaries of that good thing. It's my understanding, I've read the story, that, that in some villages in Africa, some villages in Africa, that, that 60% of those people that are over the age of 55 become blind. 60%. How is that possible? How is it possible that so many people in a village, 60% over 55, end up going blind? How is that possible? Well, what they discovered is that in those villages, there is a black fly that actually bites humans. This black fly, when it bites humans, actually secretes a parasite under the skin of that person. They don't know that. The parasite begins to grow. This parasite, they said, could grow as large as two feet. That's just unbelievable to me. Grow as long as two feet and is able to reproduce itself. And eventually it gets to the eyes and blinds the person's eyes. Lust has a way of blinding our eyes. We don't think it will. It happens so subtly. It takes us by surprise, but we think to ourselves, it cannot be a problem because I am not actually committing the act. I'm just enjoying thinking about it. But what happens is, is that all the while it is setting us up for some key moment that we do not know is coming in which it seems like everything aligns and suddenly there is a huge sense of temptation and the moment happens and that which we thought we would never do in just a moment reaction, we do it. It's the third step, Satan's desire is to compromise our surrendered, surrendered will to God by committing an act. I never thought I would do this. I saw that other people have done it. I see what happens to their lives. I was never going to allow that to happen to me. And all of a sudden, boom, there I am. And all the while he was setting us up with a harbored thought, with a lustful desire that we nurtured inside of us, and then the moment came. James 1.15 then says, and when that lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin, to the act of the sin. And things that we thought we would never do, we can't believe we did it. And this is what Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 is saying when he says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. We can't even know our own heart. It's so desperately wicked. Step four is Satan's ultimate prize is when our sin becomes a stronghold in our life. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 explains that any sin allowed to continue to grow over and over and over, suddenly our overtime begins to be a stronghold in our life. A stronghold is a habit in a part of our life in which we have now lost control. We never thought we would do the sin ever, but now it is not just once, it is over and over and over again. And we are even feeling the chains wrapping around us. 
it has become a habit and suddenly we're not in control anymore. It is. James 1.15 says, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. So now here's what I'm asking you. As you look into your own life, where is it? Is it just at the harbored thought or has it become a lustful desire? Or has it crossed over to become an act? Or is it a stronghold? And now you say, I don't even have control anymore. I keep thinking, kept thinking that I did, but suddenly I'm looking up and I don't have control anymore. Over the course of this series, we're going to be looking at what the Bible talks about in living in victory of overcoming anything in our life and living in victory. But all I've got time for this morning is just a few quick thoughts, and here it is. First of all, how do we regain that sense of freedom in our life and live in that freedom with God? The first thing is to come to know Christ as your Savior. Satan has used every excuse under the sun to try to keep you away from God. This morning, make the decision, I am tired of the excuses. I know that he's, he's real. I know that he has been active and alive in my life. And this morning, I give my heart to Christ. Let this be the day of salvation in your life. In a few moments when this service is over, right through the center doors and across the sort for you, there's a room. You'll see it, a room that is called Next Step Center. Next Step Center is over and in the window and over the door. Go to the Next Step Center. We have ministers there. We'll talk with you one-on-one. -on -one. Give us the opportunity. How does a person come to know Christ as Savior? We would love to show you. Give your heart to Christ. The second thing is realize Satan's objectives and strategies. If you know Christ as your Savior, take a good hard look what's happening in your life. I guarantee you the things I've just talked about, you are already seeing them. So get honest about yourself. Get honest about yourself and what, what's really happening inside of you. And third, surrender your thought life back to God. God, I ask for the Holy Spirit of God to be the guardian of my thought life. And God, that which is junk, God, I ask you that you convict me of it. And the moment you do, I will turn away. God, I want to be free. Surrender your thought life back over to God. Repent of the wrong that you do. Go to God and ask for forgiveness about what you have done. Go and ask Him forgiveness, whether it is just the harbored thought or it is the lustful desire, wherever it is along the process, repent of that sin in your life and let Him clean you up and regain a holiness from within. This can begin to be the start of freedom. Give Him the opportunity to do this in your heart. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the truth of your word. And now I ask that you would use this passage of Scripture and these truths that we've walked through today. And, oh, God, use them to alight our heart with the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, God, open blind eyes. Open blind eyes today. And, God, we pray that you would move in the heart of us as Christ followers to get our life right with you and begin to learn how to walk in freedom and out of bondage. Move in hearts today to say yes to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.